glad you're here today to uh, continue our study through uh, this Daniel plan we're talking about. And today we're talking about the God factor, God's power in your life. And we're talking about the awesome power of faith. And uh, you might want to look at Romans chapter 4. Um, I'm going to read a few more verses than just verse 20, as it says up there. But uh, we'll start with verse 18 and go down through verse 25. In Romans chapter 4, 18 through 25. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He has delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you this beautiful Sunday morning, we come with gratitude in our hearts for the fact that Jesus went to the cross and that you raised him from the grave. Thereby our sins are forgiven, and we now have the power to live life in the abundance of your spirit. Thank you, Father, that we're part of your family and that you don't leave us here as orphans. No, you have come to us through your Son and you have poured out your spirit upon us, and you walk with us day by day as we trust in you. So, Lord, help us to understand what faith means. Help us to begin to practice it in our lives, and help us to always rejoice in you, our God and Savior. In your precious Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we look at this passage this morning. We want to ask a question, and if you have your insert, you can follow along as we go through this passage uh, today. What kind of person does God bless? What kind of person does God bless? What kind of person does God use? That's the questions we're asking this morning. Well, I would say, as we see here in the life of Abraham, it is people who are not afraid to trust God completely. People who are not afraid to trust God completely. That's, that's what I call the faith factor. The faith factor. God blesses people who are not afraid to trust him completely. Amen? Read that again. God blesses people who are not afraid to trust him completely. And when we use that word trust, we're talking about belief. We're talking about faith. And so that is what we're looking at this morning. What is this God factor, this idea of faith? When you do that, it produces enormous power in your life. The Bible tells us there's a direct connection between faith and power. Uh, we remember Jesus uh, going to his hometown there in Matthew 13, 58. And notice what it says. Jesus did not do many miracles of power in his hometown because of their lack of faith. Because of their lack of faith. So, so here we have this connection between faith and power. Uh, Jesus couldn't do the miracles because they didn't have the faith. And, and uh, so faith and power are connected here in Matthew 13, 58. Well, in the Bible, Abraham, as we've read about, is called the father of faith. Why is he the father of faith? Well, we read there in verse 20. Notice what it says. Abraham's faith did not leave him, and he did not doubt God's promise. Instead, his faith filled him with power. His faith filled him with power. Now, that's a good news translation, but it's the same idea in uh, NIV as well that he was strengthened in his faith. His faith filled him with power. He didn't doubt. He trusted. He had faith. He believed. And because of that, God gave him the power to go on and carry through to the very end. So today we're going to look at four ways that you grow in faith so God's power can be more evident in your life. Four ways you can grow in your faith. First of all, faith is choosing and believing God's dream for my life. Faith is choosing and believing God's dream for my life. God has big plans for you and for me. 
uh, he, when he created us, as we looked at last time, uh, that we were his workmanship created by him for the work he had planned for us. And so he has things for us to do in this life. He has a purpose for our lives. You're not just an accident like the world teaches you. You're not just an inconvenience as the world sometimes says. No, God has chosen you for a reason, for a purpose. He's brought you into this world and he's designed you in such a way that he can use you for his glory. So faith is choosing and believing God's dream for my life. It's beginning to understand why he created me and, and how I can fit in to what God has in store for me. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. So what does that mean? It means that you have to have uh, something out there that draws you forward. We talked about last week that uh, those that studied those that survived the concentration camps of World War II, they discovered that those that had hope, something to look forward to, were the ones that survived, even though many of those who were in those camps with them passed away. They kept on to the very end because something kept them going. They had something that drew them to persevere through those difficulties. So they have to have a vision. You have to have something big that drags you forward. If you don't, you're going to perish. You're just going to wither away and die. You know, there, there's something bigger than life than getting the next video game. There's something bigger in life than going to the next new sensational movie that comes out. There's something bigger than in life than a, a promotion on the job. God has something big for us. He has a dream for us. He has a vision for our lives. Not just for us as individuals or for us as families. He has it in store for churches as well. God has big visions for us. Uh, Peter Guber is uh, CEO of Mandalay Entertainment, the owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And uh, he said the best advice he ever received was this, that dreams are the fuel to your future. Dreams are the fuel of your future. Uh, you have this uncluttered vision, this desire that draws you forward. And he says from an early age, he was always ambitious, and yet he was embarrassed to share that with other people because other people didn't seem to have that same ambition. But then he learned that that was okay. You have to have something that draws you forward. You have to have some ambitions. You have to have something that gives you purpose for living and moving forward. So he says over the years, people have uh, sought his advice on having a strategy for their career success. And here's what he shares with them. He says, dreams plus goals equals destiny. Dreams plus goals equals destiny. What's he mean by that? You have to have the big vision, and then you have to create the goals to get there. And when you do that, you fulfill the big dream that's out there. Now, we talked a couple weeks ago about goals and how goals are important for us. If you don't have a goal, if you don't have a plan, you're not going to succeed. You know, you can have a big idea, a big dream, but if you don't plan to get there, you're going to fail automatically. You have to have step-by-step -step process by which you go toward that dream and toward that goal. And Goober says that so many people are fearful and lack the belief they can fulfill their dreams. That's why it says here in Proverbs, where there's no vision, the people perish. You have to have a big dream, you have to have a vision, and then you go forward with it because without it, you'll wither away and you won't succeed in what you're trying to accomplish. So, so what is it about dreams? What, what kind of dreams do you need to have? Well, it's always good to line up your dreams with God's plan for your life. Amen? Amen. If you line up your plan according to God's rules, God's regulations, God's desire and will for your life, then you can start dreaming big dreams beyond your imagination. And so what we need to do First of all, is say, Lord, show me what dreams I should have. So dreamers dare to ask. They dare to ask the Lord, what is it you want me to do with my life? What, what big dreams do you have in store for my life? Where do you want me to go? How do you want me to live? Uh, Lord, you've given me some guidelines, general guidelines. What are the specifics in my life to fulfill your general guidelines and your word? Notice what it says there in Ephesians 3.20. 
God, by his mighty power at work within us, is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of. Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. Do you get that? He's able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or dream of. In other words, we don't ask big enough. We don't dream big enough. We dream too small. I remember I saw uh, Gary Smalley on, um, and he's written books on marriage and, and a lot of different areas. And um, I, I remember uh, hearing him speak, and uh, he said one day they knew they had something that needed to be shared with America because so many marriages were falling apart. And uh, he and, and the guy that was working with him had written a book on how to successfully keep your marriage intact and how to build a successful marriage in the future. So they begin to pray as a team, Lord, get us on the Oprah show. Get us on the Oprah show. This is back when Oprah Winfrey had the number one daytime television show in America. And, and I thought to myself, I would have never thought to dream that, to ask that. You know, maybe I don't dream big enough, you know. But he had a message from God, and he wanted America to hear it. So why not go to the one place that has the most people listening, right? And Ophir was in at the time. So he prayed, asked the Lord to give them that opportunity, and sure enough, the Lord opened the doors so that he could go on that show, Ophir Winfrey show, and begin to share these principles of marriage that come straight from God's word and how to succeed with your marriage. And the result was that not only did his books get out there and, and uh into many homes, but many people testified to how God had changed their lives and their marriages as a result. We just need to ask the Lord. His dreams are bigger than whatever we have in mind. Sometimes we, we're afraid that we're going to fail or afraid we're not going to do well, so we don't ask very big dreams. We don't ask the Lord uh, for too many things. And we do that because we know I can get it done in my own strength and my own power. You see? And the result is uh, if I fail, well, I didn't do good enough. But that's not what God wants, is it? He wants us to ask or dream infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. He wants to ask us to, for him to do something in our lives that we would never be able to do on our own. He wants to accomplish great things in our lives that we can never accomplish in our own power, in, in our own strength. You see, because when we operate in faith like that, we have to lean on his power. We have to trust him. So, what is your dream? What would you do if you could not fail with your own life? Some of us have never asked that question before, have we? And it's a good question to ask because it means that we've not asked big enough. But we need to ask big. What does this church need to ask? What do we dare to ask God to do? You know, um, we, we've got some building needs around here. And every time I, we bring the subject up, and it's not just me, the trustees have worked on this for over a year, putting together the list and all that. Every time we bring it up, the big question always is, well, how are we going to pay for it? That's a wrong question, isn't it? The big question is, God, do you want us to pay for it? Do you want us to go after this dream? Do you want us to re make these repairs? Do you want this place to be a facility where uh, you can still have people come and, and uh, people's lives can be changed? And if God says yes, then we need to read Ephesians 3.20, don't we? Yes. Ask big and begin to go for it. Yes. We're, we're called people of faith, so we need to dare to ask the Lord to accomplish something big in our church as well. But also, dreamers believe God's promises. Be believers, dr uh, dreamers believe God's promises. We're not asking you to do something that's not within God's guidelines and will. You see, the, the scripture tells us in 1 John that we have whatever we ask of him if it's done in accordance to his purposes and will. How do you know what his will is? How do you know what his purposes are? You study the word of God. You find out what those are, and then you begin to pray according 
to the principles of the word of God. And so we have to ask the Lord, Lord, uh, is our church doing what you've called us to do? Are we reaching out to the lost? Are we helping those who uh, are hungry and sick and helping those in need? Are, are we counseling people, and sharing the gospel with people? If we're doing those things, then Lord, let us prosper. Let us begin to, to do even more because we're trusting your promises that you want us to accomplish this. Jeremiah 32, 27. I am the Lord, the God of all peoples of the world. Is anything too hard for me? What do you think the answer to that is? Nothing's too hard for God, is it? God could do all things. He just wants us to trust him and trust his promises that he will uh, bring those things to pass. Hudson Taylor, the missionary to China, said, uh, uh, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God, right? Hudson Taylor was just a, a, a layman there in England. He decided uh, Sunday nights he didn't want to go hear another preaching service, so he went down to the poor people in town and started ministering to them and, and helping feed them and preach the gospel down there at the mission on the streets. And God began to move his heart, and he's, the Lord began to say, there's other people around this world just like these people that need to hear the good news. They, they, they don't need just to be in a nice little Bible study down at that church. They need to be out and about and sharing the good news. And suddenly Hudson Taylor got this vision for a worldwide ministry, and he began to share it with others, and they began to laugh at him and say, it's impossible, you can't do that. But God gave Hudson Taylor a dream. And, and, God, and God said to him, go, Hudson. And so Hudson Taylor began to get a group of people together, and they formed the China Inland Mission. And they went out, and Hudson Taylor gave his entire life to the people of China. And one thing Hudson Taylor said about um, three stages to God's will. There's the impossible, there is the possible, and there's the done. Right? He saw an impossible task no one else believed could be done. He did it because he asked God, and God gave him the promises to go forward. And Hudson Taylor accomplished that by giving his whole life in service to the Lord in China. You see, we just need to dream big and dare to ask and trust God's promises. He's going to fulfill what he's asked us to do. And, and so it just kind of just summarize what we've said already. Dreamers dream big. They dream big. They, they look beyond what can be done in the human power and strength. Psalm 2.8, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Ask of me. Now, the context of that passage is talking about the son. And he's asking uh, the Lord himself to, to uh, give him the nations. And so Jesus asks for the nations. But the same principle is there for us. We need to ask the Lord. Amen. We need to dream big, something beyond our imaginations. Give us the nations as our possession. What does that mean? You know, what, what does Parkview need to dream about that's real big? What do you need to dream about that's big in your own life as well? Michael Powell is the uh, CEO of MCTA. He's also the son of General Colin Powell. And uh, he said the... The best advice that he ever received from his father was this. Don't play in the baby pool. <laughs> Don't play in the baby pool. Amen. And Michael Powell said growing up as a black in America, there were all the stereotypes he had to fight, all the racial prejudice he had to fight. And he said just because his dad was a big name guy didn't mean he didn't have to go through the same struggles every other black American goes through in America. But he continued to go on, and he said that one idea that my father said, refuse to play in the baby pool. He says, with regard to his race, he counsels, I don't worry about my race. I make race the other guy's problem. I have no interest in playing on the minor league field. I want to play on the center court. If you're going to win, you're going to have to beat me there. And so Michael Powell took his father's advice, became the CEO of a company here in America. You see, he dreamed big. He didn't play in the shallows. He said, I may not 
succeed, but I'm going to try. And he went for it. He got out of the baby pool and went into the deep water, trusting that God would be his guide. So we need to dream big and trust God. The only, the only thing that can limit you is your time. You know, if you have a big dream, you might be limited by time because a big dream is going to take a long time to fulfill. You're not just talking about a year. It might be 20, 30 years for your dream to succeed. You might have an idea about a company you want to start. And, and so you're thinking not in terms of just succeeding for six months. You're thinking in terms of su- succeeding for 60 years. And so your dream's got to be real big, and you've got to make plans. And you go after that dream, and you trust God to bring that thing to pass in your life. And so you have to discuss to your, with yourself, what is the time limit? What, what's the framework that I can have this thing accomplished in my life as well? And, and then your own personal shape determines your dreams you know God shaped you in a certain way he's given you certain spiritual gifts he's given you certain heart passions he's given you certain aptitudes that that are different from anyone else right he's given he's given to you different experiences in your life that that you've gone through that no one else has gone through and so as God begins to uh, look you begin to look at your life and see how God has shaped you That also helps determine what dreams you should dream, okay? I mean, I know I'm not going to have a uh, success as a downhill skier, okay? Steve and June can tell you that, right? (laughs) I I usually end up saying, get out of the way, okay? I'm just just not geared toward that. That's not the way I'm going to succeed. So that's not a big dream in my life to be a downhill skier in the Olympics, okay? It's just not there. And, and you have things that other people might say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And you're wise enough to understand, hey, God didn't shape me that way. He didn't wire me that way. That's just not me. So find out how God wired you and then begin to think in terms of what you can accomplish and begin to dream big and ask God. And so you ask him you believe his promises, and then you dream big, and you go for it, trusting God to give you success in your life. Don't stay in the baby pool. Get out there in the deep water and do what God's called you to do. So faith is choosing and believing God's dream for my life. It's also being willing to risk failure. Faith is being willing to risk failure. You've you got to understand something here. If you don't try anything, you're never going to fail, right? Right? but you're also not going to be doing anything either, all right? Every time you attempt something, there's, there's the chance you're going to fail. You're going to fall flat on your face. There's always that risk. And so faith is being willing to risk failure. Don't, don't let the fear of failure hold you back. Jump ahead. They used to say, uh, you know, a person could get a skill and get a job and keep that job for 30 years. How many of you have had that uh, scenario in your own life? Well, that's good. You guys are pretty lucky, okay? How many of you had more than one job in your life? Yeah, that's more like it, right? Now they're saying that a person who graduates from high school is going to have at least seven different jobs in his or her life. Those that have those long-term jobs, one job, very fortunate, very, very lucky. But most of us will be scurrying around trying different jobs, trying to find a place we fit in. And that's the norm nowadays. But you're going to have to risk some failure if you're comfortable in one job and you want to switch to another job, you're going to have to take the risk, aren't you? You might not succeed in that other job. And then where will you be? Well, you'll be out of this fir- first job. You'll be out of that job. Now you've got to go look for another one. But that's all right. You, you're always pushing forward, moving ahead. You see, uh, the Bible talks about risk, even in our own Christian faith. Notice what happened in Acts 15. It says, They risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The early Christians had one concern. That was to obey the Lord, to share the good news, and make disciples of other people. And to go into all the world. And so they did that. And some of them risked their lives. They put themselves in danger. As uh, the song said that uh, was shared this morning, the scripture out of Romans 8, um, Paul 
says, you know, can any of these things that have happened to me separate me from the love of God? None of them can. You go on in 1 Corinthians, he has a whole list of things he went through. He was beaten, put in prison, he was shipwrecked, he was out in the uh, water for three days and three nights. Uh, he had to hide from the authorities, had to be let down over the side of a wall. He goes on and on and on about all the problems. And then he says, finally, at the end of that big, long, harrowing list, he says, and then i got to worry about all the worries of the churches to worry about, too. Okay? And that Paul went through all that. How, how could he do that? Because he knew that God had called him to share the good news, no matter what the risk that was involved in that. You attempt something great for God. You continue to do it, no matter what the risk is. Now, remember... Um, when we went through the study of Daniel, we came across three of Daniel's friends, didn't we? Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Remember those three? And uh, they were there with Daniel in um, uh, exile, and, and uh, so they were supposed to follow the king's advice. And Daniel and his three friends had to make choices from time to time. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or you might remember them as your shack, my shack, and a bungalow, okay? <laughs> That's a good way to remember. These three guys had to face something. Uh, they built a statue of the king, and uh, the idea was everybody has to bow down to this statue three times a day, and uh, if you don't, you're going to get thrown in the fiery furnace. So uh, some people that were trying to uh, get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in trouble, reported that, hey, king, when the call comes for people to bow, uh, they're not doing it. And so the king called them in and said, we're, we're going to give you another chance. When the trumpet sounds, you, you bow, and uh, you uh, will uh, be okay. If you don't, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. So notice what it says here in Daniel 3. They say back to the king, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, wow, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? We believe God's going to save us. We have faith that God's going to deliver us because what you're doing is not right. You're a false god. Uh, you're not God. We're not going to bow to you or your gods. We're going to worship the one true God. And, and that's, that's we believe he's going to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're still going to serve him and not you. Now, they were willing to risk failure. You see, you don't follow God just because um, things go well. You know, you, you don't bargain with God. You don't bargain with God. God, if you'll, if you'll just get my daughter out of the hospital, don't let her die, God. If, if that happens, I'll serve you all my days. And then the little girl dies. What's your response going to be? I didn't believe there was a God anyway. God doesn't care about me. God doesn't love me. He didn't hear my prayer. Ted Turner's sister died from cancer. He was studying to be a minister. And he said, God, please heal her. Please heal her. Please heal her. And when God didn't answer that prayer and his sister died, Ted Turner said, I don't love you, God, anymore. I reject you. I don't even believe you're there. And Ted Turner went on and lived a life for himself after that. Made fame and fortune. But did he lose his soul? Only God knew. You see, these three were willing to follow God no matter what the consequences were. They were willing to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you no matter what happens. Even if the circumstances go south, even if the circumstances go wrong, I'm going to trust you, God. Amen. I'm going to trust you because I believe your promises, that you're in control. You're in control. And, and so we know the result of that. God did deliver them from the fiery furnace, and the king was amazed, and he, he said, there's only one true God, and it's the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, 
we have to keep on keeping on, don't we? We have to keep on keeping on, and that's what it's all about. You're be, being willing to risk failure, and faith says, I'm going to keep on no matter what happens to me in my life. And a lot of times we're afraid to do anything because we're afraid of other people's opinions. We're afraid of what people are going to say to us. But notice what Proverbs 29 says. The fear of human opinion disables. It paralyzes us. We don't do anything because we're afraid of what someone's going to say. We don't need to worry what people say. We only need to worry what he says. Amen. We're doing this for an audience of one, not for everybody else. Okay? There's going to be some times when you make choices in your life, when you have to make decisions in your life that are unpopular. And when you do that, you're going to get criticized. You're going to, you're going to have people snap at you. They're going to say all kinds of bad things about you. And, and you just have to recognize that's going to happen. Don't, don't be afraid of other people's opinions because it paralyzes you. It disables you. Now, Susie Orman, you see her on PBS TV a lot when she talks about money advice and all that. Well, uh, she received a lot of criticism when she started her career. Um, first of all, they questioned her credentials, whether she really could give uh, financial advice. And then they questioned doing it on public television. And then they questioned whether uh, she was giving good advice or not, and on and on the criticism came. And she said uh, when she started getting this kind of blowback, she said she was very angry and confused. She said people were saying things about my work that wasn't true. They were, they were lying about me. They were attacking me, and I couldn't understand it. And then she says, I learned to be an elephant. She says she learned from a wise teacher in India that the elephant keeps walking as the dogs keep barking. The elephant keeps walking as the dogs keep barking. And we're going to have those dogs in our lives, aren't we? We just have to be elephants. We have to just keep on walking. And while the dogs are all yelping around us, all those who are critics and competitors and horrible bosses and colleagues and people who are ambitious who try to make your career go south because they want to get their career up, and so you can worry about all of them, or you can just be like an elephant and keep on walking. Keep on walking. See, the fear of human opinion disables us. We need to stop listening to the dogs and all their yelps and, and just keep on going. Unless the dog needs out, then you can let it out. Okay? Be an elephant. Be an elephant. Don't let the fear of other people disable you. And, and that means that you're going to have to be very careful. You understand who you are and what God's designed for you to do. Uh, it, it means that you don't get overconfident or uh, proud or egotistical, but it does mean you take proper assessment of your abilities, and you do what God has called you to do. Notice in Galatians 6, 4, each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. You know, to get rid of the fear of failure, you got to stop comparing yourself to other people. You got to stop listening to all the dogs barking. You got to keep on walking like an elephant. But you also got to quit listening to what people tell you you can and cannot do. Amen. You have to be very honest with yourself and with God about your abilities. Um, I, I like um, Bill Bright's wife, Ivana Bright. She she was asked, "How can you be a mother and, and still?" be part of Campus Crusade for Christ and, and, and operate as you do and be in charge of uh, this women's organization nationally. And she said, well, she said, I learned early on in my life that there are three ring circuses, there are two ring circuses, and there are one ring circuses. Some people are meant to be the leaders of a one ring circus some people were built to be leaders of a three-ring circus. She said, I had to take an honest assessment of myself, and I discovered that God gave me certain abilities to operate in these organizations as well as raise my family. You see? She did what Galatians said. She took an honest assessment of herself, and she was willing to accept what God had given her and not worry about whether she was doing it the way someone else did it or the way someone else expected her to do it. And that's what we need to do. Faith is being willing to risk failure. 
and to be honest with ourselves and with God and go after what God wants us to do. And then third, faith is expecting God to bless and use me. Expecting God to bless and use me. Here, here's a big thing. It's called, it's called uh, your attitude. It, it's your understanding that when you ask God and he begins to deliver, that you expect him to fulfill that. You expect him to bless you, expect him to use you in what uh, he's asked you to do and what you've asked him for. Philippians 1.20, Paul says this, I expect and hope I will not fail Christ in anything, but that I will have the courage now to show the greatness of Christ in my life here on earth, whether I live or die. Notice, I expect and hope. I expect and hope. Paul says, look, I'm going to do everything I can to please Christ. And I expect that I'm going to succeed. I expect God's going to bless me. I expect that God is going to to continue to pull me forward so I can do what he's called me to do. I'll have the courage to do it. And and I'll show the greatness of Christ in my life as a result. You see, he believed that God was going to answer his prayers. He believed that God was going to give him success in what he was accomplishing. And that's just that old-fashioned term called attitude. Now, as a coach of of basketball years ago, um, I I saw many a time when I had a mediocre team play a team that was two, three times better than ours, and yet we beat them. Why? Because my boys believed. They believed that if they followed the plan and did what the coach said and did their very best, they could beat that other team. Now, there were some nights that they didn't believe that. Oh, man, we can't beat them. Look at how tall they are. And they went out and played like the other people were too tall. It all came down to attitude. That's why I love basketball. It's a real psychological game. It's all, all about momentum and about what belief and what you can do and what you can't do. But that's the same way in life, isn't it? It's all about attitude. How are you approaching life? Are you approaching life with enthusiasm? Do you have the right attitude? You see, enthusiasm, we, we looked at uh, several weeks ago, it comes from that root word, on theos, in God, in God. That's where enthusiasm comes from. If, if your strength is in God, if your faith is in him, you have the power to do what God wants you to do. You have the power to go on. You believe God's going to bless you and use you because you're in Christ. You're in God. And you're going to trust him no matter what comes your way. Now, we, we have a lot of people that are just naturally enthusiastic. Uh, those of you that have read Winnie the Pooh or watched the cartoons, uh, they're the tiggers of this world, right? They're always bouncing around, always full of enthusiasm, and excitement, and, and they, have, you know, they have all kinds of energy, and they're always up, always going. Oh, those people wear me out. I tell you, they really do. Because I'm more of an Eeyore. You know, I'm more of an Eeyore, okay? Uh, Would have been a good day, but I had to get up, okay? So we we have the Tiggers this world, we have the Eeyores, right? And so uh, it doesn't matter whether you're an Eeyore or a Tigger, you both need some kind of enthusiasm. Now, Eeyore may really have to reach deep, okay? But if he's in Christ, if he's in God, he can do that. Because God will give him the power and strength to do that. So whether you're a Tigger nat- naturally or an Eeyore naturally, supernaturally, God can give you the power and strength to go on and do what you're called to do. Psalm 27, 13. I believe I shall enjoy the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Do you see that? I believe. I believe. There, there's a lot, so much negativity out now. So much negativity. America's so bad. America this, America that. President this, President that. Congress this, Congress that. So much negativity. And we Christians are a part of it. Maybe we need to do Psalm 27. I believe I shall enjoy the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Is there any circumstance that can happen in this world that God's not in charge of? 
We don't have to be afraid of anything. We don't have to be negative about anything because we know God's in control. Now, we, we can be concerned if some, some uh, children are starving. We can be concerned enough to go out there and feed them. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not being negative. That's being doing what the Lord said to do. But to say all oh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, nothing I can do about it, that's not faith. That's not belief in God. We have a big God who's in charge of everything. I'm not worried about Muslims. I'm not worried about terrorists. What, what could they do to me? Kill me? I'm in a better place. Okay? It has nothing to do with paradise and 40 virgins or whatever they call it. Okay? God's in control. God's in control. I can pray and I can witness and I can share the good news. That's what we need to be doing. Telling other people about Jesus. Instead of worrying about all the world's problems, we need to go out there and be constructive and be positive and be doing the gospel work that God called us to. And as we do that, then our community is transformed, our nation's transformed, and the world's transformed. And some of you are already doing that. You're doing that in all, all kinds of variety of ways. On your regular jobs, we, we have people that work here with children's services that are members of our church. And on a daily basis, they're helping kids that are in terrible situations. Is that the work of the Lord? You better believe it is. You see, I'd rather hear about positive things like that to hear about how bad our government is. Let's talk about the good things God's doing in this world. And let's support them and pray with them and encourage them. I believe I shall enjoy the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Matthew 9, 29. According to your faith will it be done to you. According to your faith. Those things are going to happen as you either believe or don't believe. As you trust God or you don't trust God. And Matthew 9 says we need to have it according to our faith and have it done to us. You see, Hebrews 11.1 1, is probably the most famous verse on faith. Faith assures us of things we expect and convinces us of the existence of things we cannot see. Or the traditional translation of that, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You, you see, faith believes even when it's not seen with a human eye. It believes God's going to accomplish something out there. And, and it believes that God's going to make it happen because God's in control. You know, there's a bumper sticker that people put on their cars sometimes. It's, it's called, God is my co-pilot. You ever seen that? Okay, guess what? It's not accurate. We don't want God to be our co-pilot. We want God to be our pilot. We want to have God in control. We want God to be in the driver's seat. I want him directing my life. I want him to be in control. And when I do that, I can expect him to bless and use me. When I trust him that he's going to use me in this world, I can realize I can rely on him and depend on him no matter what the situation that I face. Well, let me close with a final point. Faith is never giving up. Faith is never giving up. Never giving up. Psalm 31, 24. Be brave, be strong, don't give up. Expect God to get here soon. I like that. What did Moses tell Joshua just before he went into the promised land? He said, be strong, be courageous. What did Joshua tell the people just before they marched across the Jordan into the promised land? Be courageous, be strong. Be strong. Over and over and over it says that. Why? Because faith never gives up. It believes that God's going to see us through the very end. He's going to be there for us. Psalm 119 says, My life hangs in the balance, but I will not give up obedience to your word. I will not give up obedience to your word. That's where we need to stand, each one of us that live by faith. That no matter what happens, our health goes bad, and my life's hanging in the balance, or I'm in a foxhole with bullets going over my head, no matter where we are or what's happening to us, I will not give up obedience to your word. You, you see, in my experience, 
And in, in my own life, a lot of times what happens is we get blindsided. We get a double whammy. And we're just knocked to our knees, and we, we don't know what to do. And at that time, we're, we're in our vulnerable moment. We say, oh, what the heck? Why am I doing this? Might as well just give it all up. Who cares? I'm just going to do it for myself anymore. You ever been there? Yeah. Some people do that. Like Ted Turner, they walk away from God. And they, they just say, I give up. Life's too hard. God's not real. He's not working in my life. And instead of pushing on, keeping on, keeping on, never giving up, they do give up. But, but notice what it says in Proverbs 24, 16. Even if good people fall seven times, they will get back up. They will get back up. Here's the key. Even if you're a good person, even if you're a faithful Christian, you're going to get knocked down. It could be up to seven times. It could be 70 times. You're going to get knocked down. Life is hard. Life is difficult. We do make mistakes. We still have the sin nature. and Sometimes we follow it instead of God, and we get ourselves into bad consequences. But even though we fall seven times, good people get back up. They get back up. They get back up. They get back up. No matter what knocks them down, they get up again. Because they know that God's in control. And he forgives. And he's in charge. And he can empower them to keep on keeping on. That's why Galatians 6, 9 says this. Let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. If we don't get discouraged and give up. Keep on keeping on because victory is just around the corner. Success is just around the corner. We just got to keep plugging away, keep going, trusting God, believing, and he will bring it to pass. So don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Remember there's a story in the New Testament where, where Jesus is walking down the road and uh, a man comes and says, my child is ill, my child is ill. Please heal my child, heal my child. And, and Jesus says, what do you want me to do? And he said, heal my child. And Jesus said, do you believe? Then the father, Mark 9, 24, then the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Help me with my unbelief. Some of you here today may be in a really tough time in your life, in your marriage, in your home, on the job. Some, some of you, uh, I've heard this week, some of you just lost jobs. And uh, others are still struggling to find jobs. You're, you're in a tough spot. And you're at the place where you don't know if you can keep on. Where you can continue to have faith. But like this father, you, you need to say, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Help me, Lord, with my unbelief. Where you doubt, where you have fear, where, where you're worried about failure, Maybe you've been knocked down. You just need to call out, Lord, help my unbelief. Pick me up. Bring about your victory in my life. So are you ready to believe? Are you ready to believe? Some of you are here today, and, and we've talked about faith, and uh, you're not even sure what that means as far as who to put faith in. Well, let, let me tell you. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's son. He came to this earth to live a life that shows us exactly who God is. And then because he was sinless, he gave his life on the cross. He went to that cross to take your sins and my sins upon himself. And there he punished the sins there. There they were forgiven and covered with his blood. So we have forgiveness of sins. And three days later, God's power by his spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Now we know he has the power to give eternal life. And so if you put your faith and trust in him, you will not only receive forgiveness of sins, you'll receive his Holy Spirit power to live in you, to help you go through life. You see? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes, that's faith, in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the power of God. Faith and power. 
God gives it to you through his son, Jesus Christ. Christian, you've been walking with him a while. It still works that way. Faith and power. Trust his word, trust his promises, and he'll give you the power you need to accomplish what needs to be done. We're going to close in prayer. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And God's spirit is speaking to you. We're going to ask you to come and give your life to Christ, to come and respond to the Holy Spirit's promptings in your life. Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, your spirit is at work. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will speak to each one here. Each of us, Father, needs to understand what faith is. Lord, we need to take those risks of failure. We need to put our trust in your promises. We need to dream big and believe that you can accomplish things and that you will bring those things to pass. And Lord, we need the faith to not give up, to keep on. And there's some here today, Father, that need to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior for the very first time. Help them to do that and to take a step and receive him as Lord today. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand together as we sing.